preaching, uh, I'm preaching from, from the subject, great things come in small packages. Great things come in small packages. I'm, I'm in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 30, verse 24 through 28. Uh, we're not going to stand and read it, but that just lets you know if you weren't here last night, you, the train is already in motion. So we're just going to keep on moving down the track. They're, they're, the, they're the move of God in this place. Hmm. Hmm. In, in the text we compared, in the introduction we talked about the, the big five in South Africa and how preferred they were and pursued for the safari. But when God got ready to express his glory, he used the little four. We talked about two of the little four, and it is my intention by the grace of God before I finish tonight to talk about the last two, number three and number four. But before I do, I want to examine the subject a little bit tonight. Great things come in small packages. Great things come in small. Most, most believers, don't really recognize that their body houses the Spirit of God. I mean spirit-filled, tongue-talking, anointed believers seem not to be cognizant of the fact that the glory of God lives in your body. And it's not so much that we intend to be unbelievers, it's just that it boggles the mind when you, when you begin to think of the greatness of God. See, most people don't know how great God is. They've reduced God down to good. God is good, but God is more than good. <laughs> good just describes an aspect of God. God is more than good. God is great. God is awesome. God is omnipotent. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God filleth all in all. He is before all things and in all things and by him all things consist. Years ago when I was growing up, Life magazine had on the cover of their magazine, a very controversial heading. It said, is God dead? And they debated for months and perhaps even years after that, is God dead? It was the most ridiculous, idiotic thing I had ever heard in my life. There is no way that God could die. He wasn't born. So he can't die. Moses went back as far as he could go, and when he got all the way back to the beginning, God was standing behind that. So he said, in the beginning, God. He couldn't find God's beginning. He could only find our beginning. And when he backed it up as far as he could go, he said God was still standing somewhere behind that. David looked at it and said, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. One writer says, without father or mother, without beginning or end of days, he is the Melchizedek. He ever liveth. He ever liveth. He is God. One writer says that he sits on the circle of the earth. That heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. God said, I'm so big that I rest my feet on your planet. I'm God, meaning everything is up under my control and up under my auspices. There is absolutely nothing going on that I don't have control over, not of things in the earth or things under the earth. And then he says, I alone am God. I alone am God. I don't have a committee. I don't have a board. I don't have any directors. I don't have a boss. I alone am God, and beside me there is no other. 
He said, I look for someone greater than me to swear by. He said, but I couldn't find anything greater than myself. Now, you know, when God can't find it, you know we can give up on trying to find. God said, I couldn't find anything greater than myself. Therefore, I swear by myself. He's the by myself God. I redeemed you by myself. I called you by myself. I saved you by myself. I helped you by myself. I delivered you by myself. I'll rapture you by myself. I'll preserve you by myself. I'll keep you by myself. I'll protect you by myself. I'll provide for you by myself. I'll counsel you by myself. I'll repair you by myself. I'll raise you by myself. I am the standalone God. Now it becomes, it becomes inconceivable, hardly comprehensible that, that the God of the universe, the God of eternity would make himself available to you. First place, the book of Genesis moves, talks about the Spirit of God. It says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. The very first thing God tells us about his Spirit is that it moves. It moves, and from the book of Genesis where it moves to the book of Revelations where it says, even so, come Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God is moving and coming from chapter to chapter, from verse to verse. He's always intervening and sometimes interfering in the affairs of man because he is God and he has the right to do that and nobody can stop him from doing it. He's God all by himself. The Spirit moved upon the face of the deep. But then the Bible, when it begins to talk about God dealing with man, in about the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis, he begins to warn us, my spirit will not strive with man always. So there was a striving period where the spirit of God begins to strive with us. It begins to wrestle. It begins to develop. It's talking about Noah, but even with us, it strives with us. There's a time in your life where God is striving with you. Some of you are in here right now, whether you know it or not, God is striving with you. You haven't really sold out to God. You haven't even committed your life to the Lord, and there's a struggle going on. And some of you have a strong resistance to God, and, and you can't have resistance without an opposite force pulling. And the reason you're so obstinate about God is because there's a struggle going on in your life, and God is striving with you. And some of you are proud of how well you have resisted God. But I want to warn you, I want to warn you, you should be afraid. Suppose he stops calling. Suppose he stops pulling. Suppose he stops tugging at your heart. You, 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 that's why he said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. He said, don't play hard to get with me because I don't have to have you. I could raise up somebody that looks just like you. They never know you were gone, but it just pleased me to draw you. The Spirit of God that moved upon the face of the deep in the eighth chapter of the book of Genesis begins to strive with man. We soon enter into a period where we see visitations of the Holy Spirit, where the, where the Holy Spirit comes upon us for a specific task. This visitation is, uh, is, is represented by the anointing that falls upon us when we consecrate people to the priesthood and they're anointed and the oil fell upon the head of Aaron and onto his beards and onto his skirts. God anointing them to perform a particular task. And all through the Old Testament you hear phrases like the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Joshua and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Ezekiel, meaning that God anointed them just for a particular task or assignment. These visitations, these visitations of the great God visiting man happened over and over in the Old Testament all the way up through the minor prophets and the major prophets and all through the books of poetry. We see God visiting people, visiting his kings and visiting his judges and visiting his priests and visiting his prophets for a particular assignment. He, he visited Habakkuk, he, he visited Jeremiah, he visited Obadiah, he visited Zephaniah, he 
visited Micah. He visited Amos. He visited Habakkuk. He visited Malachi. He visited all the way up to Malachi. And for 400 years, God said absolutely nothing at all. The next time we see the Spirit of God move, he's not just moving on prophets, priests, nor kings, but there is a pregnant woman. A woman named Ezekiel, an old woman who is a woman named Elizabeth, an old woman who is pregnant with a child that she doesn't understand how in the world she was able to get pregnant. And there is a young girl who gets pregnant shortly thereafter her, her cousin named Mary. And Mary is pregnant with that that was given to her because the Holy Ghost has come up upon her. The Holy Ghost has come upon her and filled her and there's something in her belly and when Mary in her confusion about her pregnancy because she knows that she's never been with a man goes and knocks on the door of her cousin Elizabeth. The Bible said that when these two pregnant women, see let me tell you something about fellowship. The reason our fellowship is not as powerful as it ought to be is because we fellowship with people that have empty wounds. And when you fellowship with people that have empty wounds, they drain you. They pull the life out of you. They pull the strength out of you because they don't have anything in them to give you. But if you can find, if you can find any two people who are pregnant with that that God has done. I'm not talking about what the university did. I'm not talking about something that you mimicked. I'm not something that you practiced in the mirror. But if you run into two people that are pregnant with what God has done, the Bible says that when Mary and Elizabeth greeted each other, the babies leaped in their womb and were filled with the Holy Ghost. Think of that, that God would fill a baby, an embryo, still in its mother's womb, having the water hadn't broken, the baby hadn't cried, and floating in its mother's fluid, already filled with the Holy Ghost. How can you do that? Because great things come in small packages. Look at God. The first man, Adam, God, God created him grown. The first man, Adam, was never a baby, never developed, never grew. The second man, Adam, God started in him in the womb, filled him with the Holy Ghost, born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, because God wants you to know, though I am omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, I'm going to do my greatest work in small packages. When you begin to understand that, you understand God's purpose in the earth is to dwell in you. In you. Say me. me. Talking about you sitting right there with all the problems and all the crises and all the troubles and all the weaknesses and all the inconsistency. Do you understand that God chose to live in you? A small thing, a weak thing, a frail thing, an inconsistent thing, but it just pleased God to make his abode in your house. I would wager that the vast majority of the people in this room have no sense or consciousness that God lives in them. Because if you did, defeat would not be in your vocabulary. If you really believe that God was with you, then how could you fear your boat was going to sink? How can your boat sink if Jesus is aboard? Even if he's asleep, if he's on the ship anywhere, I don't care how fierce the storm is, he will never overwhelm you. He lives in you. I want you to say this with me. He lives in me. He lives in me. Say it again. Now think about what you said. Every day, every morning, every evening, every night, every week, every month, every year, every season, he lives in you. He dwells in you. He doesn't come and go. He doesn't just visit you for church. He doesn't just come upon you for when you preach. That's all over in the Old Testament. He's not just striving with your weaknesses and your sins. That's all over in the Old Testament. He's not just coming upon you for an assignment, but he lives in you. What the Apostle Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't sink me. 
you can't sink me. No matter how you try, you can't sink me. The storm can break out everywhere, but you'll never sink me. You may make me cry, but you won't sink me. You may get on my nerves, but you won't sink me. You may make me weak, but you won't sink me. I may be inconsistent, but you won't sink me. I may be tossed to and fro, but you won't sink me. Look at your neighbor and say, I know I don't look like much, but great things. Great things come in small packages. Paul says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be of God and not of us. He put it in cheap vessels. The vessel isn't much, but the contents are awesome. And whenever you start operating in that level of anointing that we were in last night, powerful things begin to happen because you have pushed past the flesh into the supernatural. When you get in the supernatural, you can do things that you couldn't do in your flesh. And the reason most of you are tired right now is because you're trying to do spiritual warfare in your flesh. And you cannot win a spiritual victory while you're operating in your flesh. You have got to fight in the spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth every thought into captivity unto the obedience of Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm going to whip the enemy. No, say it like to me, I'm going to whip the enemy with something that you can't see. He'll never even see it coming. He'll never even know what hit him. He'll be looking at me saying, ain't nothing to the package. But don't let the package fool you. The package may be small, but the stuff inside of it is explosive. It's dynamite. It's dunamis. It is the force of God. Somebody holler, God! Whenever you call him. I said, whenever you call him, whenever you get tired of calling people and break down and call him, I don't care if they lock you in a jail cell, whenever you call him, whenever you throw your head back and holler his name, he said his ear is open to your cry. Somebody holler, God! He'll come into your storm, into your midnight, into your crisis, into your dilemma. He knows your voice. While you're trying to learn his voice, God already knows your voice. I don't care if a thousand people are screaming. If you call him, God can always hear you. And he said, I will come to you. If I've got to break in the jail and come get you, I will come to you. Look at your neighbor and say, be careful how you handle me. I'm dynamite. Yeah. I am dynamite. I am dynamite. I am dynamite. Oh, it's not the package. The package is just junk. But if you get past the wrapper down on the inside, there's some great stuff down inside side of me. And you've got to understand this greatness in weakness, this greatness in weakness. God said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. I always choose something weak so that the glory can be of me and not of you. It pleases me to show how much I can do in something small and tiny and insignificant because I'm God. And somebody says, how can that little ant pull that great big thing it's got hold to? It's because of God is behind it. And when God gets behind you, you don't have to have enough money, enough friends, enough help, enough strength, enough teeth, enough husband, enough wife, enough anything else. But if God be behind you, put your hand on your stomach and holler, the Lord is with me. Oh, that's shouting stuff right there. The Lord 
is with me. I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved because the Lord is with me. Paul says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Some of you have never released the real anointing that you have inside. And I would venture to say that's the reason you're going through some of the troubles you're going through. Because trouble presses the anointing out of you. If you would just learn how to open up, you wouldn't have to be pressed like that. But because you're so tight and so close and so kept and so in control, God has to send stuff in your life that you can't control so he can press the anointing out of you. Whenever you learn how to just open up and release it, you won't have to go through so much. But because your spirit, your will is so strong and so stubborn, God allows you to go through pressings and crushing until finally you open up and your spirit opens up and the glory of the Lord begins to come up out of your belly and you're in trouble and you have nobody to talk to but God and if God doesn't help you you're going to lose your mind and you find yourself with tears running down your face say Lord I need and the glory that's been on the inside begins to come up out of your belly How many people want to be more godly tonight? In order to be more godly, you must heed the sermon, the sermon of the ant. The sermon of the ant, as I told you last night, is to prepare yourself. Prepare yourself for the things that God is about to do. God wants you to be a think ahead person. A think ahead, look ahead person. A person whose mind is always down the road. If you interview anybody that's ever been significantly blessed, they are always talking about the next move. There are always several steps ahead of the pack. They're thinking about what they're going to do next year. While, while people who fail are talking about what happened to them. Oh, I'm talking to you. People who fail are always regurgitating the same experiences, repeating them over and over again, unable to bring closure. People who are successful are always thinking, you know what I'm going to do? You know what I'm doing? And after that, I'm going to do this over here. And I got a plan. If things work out over there, I got a plan. I'm going to go over there. And they're always thinking ahead. In fact, people who have heard the message of the end are getting happy now about... And, and it will almost make them look idiotic because you are looking at the condition they're in right now and saying, how can she shout at a time like this? But she's not looking at where she is. She's looking at where she's going and she's already living, already walking, already moving, already talking in the future. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm already in the future. And I'm telling you, it's getting better all the time. I'm telling you, it's going to be all right. I'm not worried about my present because I've already been to the top of the mountain. I've already seen the other side. I already know how the story is. And so the stuff that I'm dragging now, I'm not dragging stuff to fix where I am. I'm not working on where I am. Where I am will take care of itself. I'm working on where I'm going. When I tell you to prepare yourself, I want to see you building stuff for the next move. I want to see you build an ark in your backyard and wait for the rain. I want to see you make life catch up with you. People who walk with God are always ahead of life. They do stupid stuff. People laugh at them and call them crazy. They prepare for rain and nobody's ever heard of rain. They build boats in their backyard and let the rain catch up with them. They're ahead of their time because they're already walking in the next dimension. Are there any people in this room who are starting to walk in the next dimension? 
and, and you almost seem crazy because you're not worried about things that other people are worried about. And you almost become casual. You say, oh, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right. And you know you didn't used to be like that. You used to worry about everything. But you're finally coming to the point that you heeded the message of the hand and you're preparing yourself. And then I told you last night that the conies, the conies teach us to position ourselves, to operate life from a position of strength. Everybody has weaknesses. This, this is a message, let me say that again, everybody has weaknesses. Just because you have a weakness doesn't mean you can't survive the jungle. But you have to operate from the position of your strength rather than from the position of your weakness. Everybody has weaknesses. Everybody in here has weaknesses. Inconsistencies, inabilities, frailties, vulnerabilities, areas where they're intimidated. Everybody in here. I don't care how saved, how spiritual, how anointed, how consecrated, how rich, how pretty, how tall, how short. Everybody in here could heed the voice of the conies. In some area of your life, you are limited. But if you will allow God to position you, God has already got a place that will accommodate your weakness and build you up where you can live your life from a position of strength. So we've heard from the ant, and we've heard from the conies, and they have taught us well. They have spoken things to us that we needed to hear. If we have listened well to these little voices, we can survive the jungle, and the lion will not destroy us, nor will the elephant trample us, the leopard will not catch us. The rhino will not gore us. The buffalo will not stumble us because we have heard the voice of the ant and the conies. But if we stop with the ant and the conies, my job will not be complete. I want you to touch everybody you can reach and tell them the locusts are coming, 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 the locusts are coming. The locusts, the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. The locusts, the locusts are coming. The locusts, the locusts, the locusts are coming. The locusts, the locusts are coming. 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 The locusts, the locusts. My God, the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. That's what they would say in the cities. That's what they would say in the Eastern civilization when they looked up and saw them. They look up and they scream, "The locusts are coming! The locusts are coming!" They were more afraid of the locusts than they were marching armies and chariots. They would rather deal with horses and swords and shields than to deal with the locusts because if the locusts came into a city, they would turn the city upside down. The locusts would bring down great civilizations and great kingdoms. They would destroy empires, crops, cattle. Everything died when the locusts came. And so the Bible says that we must heed the voice of the locusts. For there is something that the locust knows that God wants the church to know. If the church can ever begin to operate like the locusts, then no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. If the church can ever focus like the locusts, and do what the locust does. You can go into the enemy's camp and take back uh, what he stole from you, but you've got to learn how to do it like the locust. Uh, look at somebody and tell them the locusts are coming. Uh, the locusts are coming. Uh, the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. The Bible says uh, that the locust has some attributes uh, that I want to deliver to you tonight. And as you begin to understand these attributes, if you can get a hold to them, they will change your life. Uh, when you hear the voice of the locust, the the locust teaches you something different from the coney and something different from the ant. For the ant drags his morsel of meat by himself and the coney hides on the rock by himself. But the locust never does anything by himself. If the church is going to learn from the locusts, you have got to come from your individualistic attitude and begin to understand that if you're going to get this next wave of glory, you can't go in by yourself. 
The locusts always come in a swarm. They come in a mass. They come in a pack. They come in a crowd. In fact, the Bible says that when the locusts came into a city, they would blacken the sky. They would darken out the sun. You couldn't even see the sun when the locusts came. The locusts were so awesome. Now, I know you, 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 you got to get this because the enemy will try to build up a resistance against the locusts, but there is absolutely nothing you can do when the locusts hit a city there was nothing you could build that would keep them out if you built a wall they would come across it if they ran into it they would shrink down and come through the cracks in the wall until they got in the city once they broke through a crack in the wall they would take over the city if they got in one window or one door they would eat up everything Thing in the house. They would eat up all vegetation until literally it looked like when the locusts hit a city, it would look like the city had been set on fire. There would be nothing green left when the locusts hit the place. They would devour everything. See, you got to run with some hungry people. You can't run with some weak, satisfied, laid back casual, mediocre people. You've got to run in a pack of people who have an appetite for life, an appetite for God, an appetite for an anointing. See, that will stop jealousy. If you run with hungry people, they're so busy eating what's in front of them that they don't mind you eating what's in front of you. You've been running with lazy people, but you got to run with hungry people. The locust only runs with people that have a great appetite. Touch somebody and tell them the locusts are coming. If locusts get in a city, they'll turn it upside down. If it happens in the spirit, it will turn a city upside down. If two hungry saints of God get in your office, they will turn your office upside down. If you and your neighbor start praying in your neighborhood, you will devour your neighborhood. If you can find anybody in your house to touch and agree with you, you can devour anything that the enemy is trying to do in your house, but you've got to hear the voice of the locusts. Oh, the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. For this move of God, you've got to let somebody help you. And some of you have issues with letting people in your life. You don't want to talk to anybody. You don't want to open up to anybody. You don't want to admit to anybody that you need anything. But the locust is teaching you that you're going to need some help to get to this next level. Touch your neighbor and say, I'm going to need some help. I, I, I need to surround myself with people that can help me. I need to surround myself with people that got an appetite. I need to surround myself with people of passion and people of force. I need to surround myself with people who will not be defeated. I was reading in one book that they tried to burn the locusts to stop them from getting in the city. And the locusts come in so many masses that in the Hebrew, the, in the Hebraistic terms of the text, it says that they are the insects without number, which means they cannot be numbered. They come in so many masses that even when they tried to set them on fire, the first few would die. And they'd die to put the fire out so that the rest of them could cross over. And when I read about the first one dying so that the rest of them could cross over, I thought about Jesus, for the enemy lit a fire, and he died so that I could cross over. Tell somebody and tell them the locusts are coming. If the devil would have been smart, he would have never crucified the Lord. For when he crucified the Lord, he opened up a way for me to cross through the burning smoke of the crucifixion and to cross over to the other side. There is no reason why you ought to be defeated today. Jesus died so that you could go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. Jesus died so that you could cross over into the next level. Jesus died so that no weapon formed against you should be able to prosper. Touch somebody and tell them the locusts are coming, the locusts are coming, the locusts are coming. My God. But they were literally unstoppable. You messed up when you quit. The message of the locust to you is don't quit. 
no matter how many obstacles or walls are built up against you, the word from the locust to you is never give up. Do not quit. Look at somebody and say, do not quit. The locust will teach you if you can't get in the door, come in the window. If you can't get in the window, climb down through the gutter. If you can't get in the gutter, come in up under the porch. The locust teaches you to keep on fighting and keep on pushing and keep on dragging. And by the way, they're not big. They're not big, but they're relentless. Are there any relentless people in here? I want to talk to about a hundred relentless people in here. Where are you, my relentless people? Yeah, I'm looking for some relentless people, some come hell or high water people, some people who will not be denied, some people who will not stop, some people who will not give up. Slap somebody and tell them I'm relentless. I've been through hell and high water, but I'm still here. They tried to stop me at every turn, but I'm still here. Some of you, the devil tried to kill you in your mama's womb, but you're still here. You got sick as a baby, but you're still here. You got afflicted in your youth, but you're still here. You should have been locked up in jail, but you're still here. People tried to kill you, but you're still here. Somebody tried to shoot you, but you're still here. You've been in a car wreck, but you're still here. You come out of surgery, but you're still here. You got an affliction in your body, but you're still here. You got a lump in your breast, but you're still here. You're shooting insulin, but you're still here. You're taking blood pressure medication, but you're still here. Ah, call at me. Ah, want to talk to the locusts. Touch seven people and tell them I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm relentless. I'm reckless. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm, still here. I'm little, but I'm bad. I'm still here. I'm broke, but I'm bad. I'm still here. I'm lonely, but I'm bad. I'm still here. I'm hurting, but I'm bad. I'm still here. Oh, hit five people. Tell them the locusts are coming. The locusts are coming. See, most people want to pastor the rich and the mighty, the influential and the powerful. But that don't bother me. I just want to pastor the locusts. Yeah. Give me some reckless people. Give me some relentless people. Give me some people who won't quit, who won't stop, who won't take down. You talk about revival? Revival comes from the locusts. Are there any locusts in the house? Yeah, 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 yeah. Survivor with your bad self. Survivor against all odds. Survivor against all storms. Survivor against all crisis. Survivor against all dilemma. Make some noise in the house. Brother and sister locusts, take about 10 seconds and give God a crazy praise. Bible teaches us. Sit down, sit down, sit down. We're just talking. Mm. The Bible teaches us that the locust is not like the bee. The bee sends out someone to go first, finds out where the nectar is, and comes back to the hive. But the Bible says the locust has no leader. 
and what it means by that is God is getting ready to take you someplace that no one has ever been before. Ooh. <laughs> God is getting ready to do something in your life. You're not going to copy somebody else's testimony, but God is going to do something in your life so powerful that you're going to say, I have never passed this way before. There'll be no books on it. There'll be no manuals on it. There'll be no tapes on it. There'll be nobody to bear witness. But the Lord said, I'm going to do a new thing in you. You lost your job, so what? God's gonna create a job, a new thing, a fresh thing, a greater thing, for the former things are passed away. And I got a word for somebody in here. Reach down in your belly and do something new. your neighbor and say, I got something new in me. Something I ain't heard nobody talking about. Something I've never seen anybody do before. But it's all in my spirit. It's all in my dreams. It's all in my mind. It's all in my heart. God said, y'all got to help me because I feel like preaching in here. Look at this church. talk to somebody who thought you was crazy because you had something in your mind that nobody else was talking about. You had something in your heart that nobody in your family has ever done. But God is saying, I'm getting ready to use you in a unique way. You're not going to be like your mama. You're not going to be like your daddy. You're not going to be like your grandpa. God says you're not going to have a leader. You're going to set the trace. You're going to set the pace. You're going to blaze the trail. Other people are going to follow behind you. You're going to be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Say it! I want to show you something. Sit down, sit down. Y'all keep jumping up and sit down. See, the Lord walked past the elephant and the lion and the buffalo and the leopard and the rhino, and the rhinoceros, and the giraffe, and the orangutan, and the monkey, and the fox, and the rabbit, and the frog. And way down in the bushes, he found a little creature that looks like the grasshopper. He's similar to the grasshopper. He's, he's in the family of the grasshopper. He is a locust. He is a straight-winged insect. He's a straight wing, straight narrow winged insect. And by all rights, you must understand something about the locust. Though he travels for miles, though he travels for miles, though he travels for miles, he can't fly. His wings are too narrow for him to fly. But he can travel for miles through the air, but he can't fly. see, if you're looking at his wings, you'll never see his strength. 
for his strength is not in his wings. His strength is in his legs. He can't fly, but he can jump. So number three is propel yourself. And you learn how to propel yourself from the locust. The locust could lay around and say, I can't fly and give up and quit. But the locust says, I can't fly, but I can jump. The locust can jump 200 times his height. And when he gets ready to go somewhere, he propels himself. I want somebody who's in trouble to touch a neighbor and say, I'm going to jump out of this mess. I'm coming out fast. I'm coming out quick. I'm not going to wait. I'm not going to take a long time. I'm going to jump out of this mess. I'm coming out in a quickness. I'm going to prepare myself. Somebody just jump a minute. I'm going to sit down, sit down. I got to show you something here. Y'all okay. thought I was lost. I was never lost. I know where I'm going. It's going to be some jumpers in here. Just when the enemy thought he had you, you're going to propel yourself. The devil was looking at your wings and saying you don't have much wings. The devil was looking at your money saying she ain't got much money. The devil was looking at your education saying you don't have much education. The devil was looking at your age saying you waited too late. But the devil was looking in the wrong spot. Yeah! Yeah! So what the locust does, he propels himself. But the answer is not just in him jumping, it's when he jumps. The locust is so smart that he waits till the wind blows. And when the locust Here's the rustling in the tops of the trees, and he can tell that it's a great gust of wind. All the locust has to do is jump up into the wind, and the wind will carry the locust for miles. And the Lord sent me here to tell you that your wind is about to blow, and if you jump right now, people, touch three people and tell them the wind is blowing. 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 The wind. 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 Locusts just wait on the wind. And when the wind blows, propel yourself. Now, can I tell you something? Locusts, when the wind blows, see, I almost don't want to even get into this. But my Bible scholars understand that when I talk about the wind, the wind is the Holy Ghost. For the Bible said 
that Jesus said that the Spirit is like a wind, for it bloweth where it listeth, and we know not from whence it came, and yet we experience where it's going. And in the book of Acts, it said, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing. So what it means, what it means, when the Holy Ghost moves, where you couldn't fly by yourself, if you leap into the anointing, the wisdom of the locust, the wisdom of the locust is that the locust knows that the wind will blow it for miles. Watch this, y'all, watch this. Here's the only problem. The locust cannot navigate where he goes. The locust cannot fly against the wind. The locust cannot chart his own course, nor can he change the direction. The locust is dependent upon the wind, and wherever the wind blows, that's where the locust goes. And the Lord said, if you want to be blessed this year, you got to propel yourself into the wind. And wherever the wind blows, that's where you've got to go. Hit your neighbor and say, stop flying against the wind. Where my locusts at? The wind blows the locusts from miles. Listen to this. I have a word from God for you. If you will learn the sermon of the locusts and only leap when the wind blows, the next wind that comes by you is going to blow you completely out of the situation you've been into. It's going to take you into the next dimension. And the Lord sent me here to tell you that when the locust gets in the wind, he travels without struggle. He travels without stress because it is not the flapping of his wings that gets him there. It is the power of the wind. And the Lord said, you've been flapping your wings and wearing yourself down, trying to propel yourself through your own strength. But all you got to do is leap high enough to get in the wind of God's Spirit. And when God's Spirit begins to blow, as it begins to blow, it's going to blow you into success. It's going to blow you into your money. It's going to blow you into your healing. It's going to blow you into your husband. It's going to blow you into your wife. It's going to blow you into your calling. It's going to blow you into your future. It's going to blow you into your ministry. You don't have to make a name for yourself. All you got to do is propel yourself into the wind. Throw your hands up and say, into the wind I go. 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 Open your mouth and begin to praise him right now. Praise him, praise him. Listen, church, I noticed something. I noticed something periodically, periodically in my life. Something would hit. And for the next several years, all I had to do was go with the flow. All I had to do was go with the flow. People wouldn't even believe it. They'll think you did something. But, but I knew that my wings were too small 
to travel this far. So it couldn't be me flapping that got me here. <laughs> it had to be the wind I was in. And if you're going to be blessed, you've got to get that ability to recognize the wind. Check this out. Check this out. What you're listening for, you're not listening for CNN. You're not listening for the change in the stock market. You're not listening to the news at the barber shop. You're listening. For the wind. And when you hear the wind, that's when you start positioning yourself to propel yourself. Now watch this. If the wind blows and you don't jump, you miss it. It means God was doing something, but you were too low to get it. And there are some people in the room, it's not that God wasn't moving. It was that you never propelled yourself into the presence of God. And you think that the enemy's fighting you, but it is not the enemy that's fighting you. It is because you haven't heard the voice of the locust. You've never learned to propel yourself. There's a, let, let me show you something. Let me show you something. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm feeling something. For everything, there is a purpose, a season, and a time. A purpose that's eternal that deals with what God eternally had in mind to occur in your life. A season is your window to do it. Your time deals with earth and it is something that you have to do. You have to know when it's time to do what. You can't control the season and you didn't set the purpose. But the timing issue is something that you have to have. Timing. Look at somebody and say, it's my time, it's my time. Now let me show you something, let me show you something. Hold it a minute, see, let me show you something. We were singing a while ago, and I saw this brother clapping, and he was clapping all off the beat. I mean, he was having a good time, but he was completely off the beat. And the problem with that is you can't teach somebody timing. Timing is something you have to sense. If you can't sense it, you will miss it. This is why the enemy sends sin in your life to dull your senses so that you can't feel the time. The devil can't stop your purpose. He can't stop your season, but he tries to mess with your time so that you're doing the right thing at the wrong time or the wrong thing at the right time. And when it's time for you to be moving ahead, you're stuck doing the wrong thing. It wasn't that the brother wasn't clapping, it's just that he was clapping at the wrong time. He had his hands together when they should have been apart, and he had them apart when they should have been together. Check this out. There's somebody in this room 
your wind is blowing. Your wind is blowing. Your purpose is set. Your season is here. But your sin has dulled your senses and you cannot feel the time. So when it is a time that you should be teachers, you have need that someone teach you. When it is a time that you should be leading the way, you're falling apart because sin has dulled your senses. And something in you has to say, I cannot let this sin make me miss my time. Listen, 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 hear me good, hear me good. I don't want you to be like the masses of people who go to church for years and applaud their leaders for their leaders since the time, but the people never develop their own sense of time and they miss their season because every time the wind blows, they're too low to travel as far as God wants to take them to receive what God has for them. When you hear the wind blow, you have to lock down everything until you have made up in your mind, I will let nothing separate me. Not this time. I've missed my time before, but not this time. I've made mistakes before, but not this time. I don't want to spend my life wishing I had done something that I didn't get to do, not because God wasn't ready, but because I missed my time. Some of you are angry and bitter with people right now, and the reason you're bitter is because you miss your time. You have the spirit of Saul. Saul tried to kill David because Saul missed his time. David was only getting what Saul already had, but Saul missed his time. For when the wind was blowing, Saul was too low. Listen at this, my brothers and sisters. This is the wisdom of the locust. The locust knows when to jump. If the locust were in a meeting like this, and the spirit was this high, and the excitement was this strong, the locusts would know that no man can call a revival and the wind blow this strong. The locusts would know that only God can cause the wind to blow this strong until people come out in masses. When I looked out on the parking lot, people had filled up the parking lot. They were parked on the side of the road. Some of my staff told me one lady left her keys in the car, leaped out the car, running in the service. No man, no man can do those things. It's only when God sends a wind. I came to Shayata. I came to tell this church that the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. And if you would jump now, the thing that you couldn't do before, if you would jump now, if you would jump right now, you could jump out of habits and yokes and bondages and strongholds in your life because the wind is blowing. When the wind blows, drugs can't hold you. When the wind blows, crack can't hold you. When the wind blows, cigarettes can't hold you. When the wind blows, lovers can't hold you. When the wind blows, your deepest sin cannot hold you. When the wind blows, doubt and fear cannot hold you. I came to tell you this is all I can do tonight. I, if I don't do nothing else tonight, I don't know what you're going to do about it. I can't control your reaction, but it's my job to tell you the wind is blowing. Yeah. 
Stand to your feet. I can't go to the spider. I've got to stop with the locusts. I want you to lift your hands and open your mouth and begin to worship God out of your mouth until you sense the wind of God over your life. Yes, Lord. 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 The wind is blowing. He shot, nah, 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 yeah. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? The wind is blowing. What are you going to do about it? The wind is blowing. What are you going to do about it? The wind is blowing. What are you going to do? The wind is blowing. What will you do? What will you do? What will you do? The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. Set up a rustling in the trees, oh God. Move in the midst of your people. The wind is blowing. I feel a mighty rushing wind blowing in this house. What will you do with the wind? The wind is blowing. 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 I want my preachers to step back up on the pulpit. Step all the way back up on the pulpit. The wind is blowing. 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 Something in your spirit is telling you to move. You need to move right now. The wind is blowing. Something down in your belly wants to respond. It's because the wind is blowing. The Holy Ghost is nudging you because the wind is blowing. The wind of God, the wind of God is blowing, is blowing tonight. There's a wind in your life. There's a wind right now. The enemy tried to kill you, but the wind is blowing tonight. The wind of the mighty God is blowing over your life tonight. The wind of a mighty God is blowing in your life tonight. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. And God said, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, if they'll seek my faith and turn from the wicked way, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I'll heal their land. God said, I will forgive it. I will forgive it. I will forgive it. If you propel yourself, I will heal your land. The wind is blowing. The wind, the wind, the wind, the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. The wind, the wind of God is blowing. It's blowing in the balcony. It's blowing in the balcony. The wind of God is blowing. I come against every stubborn spirit. I come against every strong spirit. I come against every demonic influence. I come against every satanic stronghold. God said, let my people go. Let my people go. I call my people to the wind. I I call my people to the wind. I call my people to the wind. I call my people to the wind. I break every struggle. I break every bondage. The wind is blowing. The wind, the wind. Oh, howl, howl in the presence of the Lord. For the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. Let the wind blow. Let the wind blow in this place. Lord, let the wind blow. Let it blow through the balcony. Let it blow through the choir stand. Let it blow in every pew. The wind of God is blowing tonight. Somebody open your mouth and give God glory. 